Hi, I'm Kevin. I'm one of the pastors here at Journey Church, and I'm so glad, we're so glad that you decided to join us today and give us some of your time. We are in the middle of a series that we're calling Unshakable Hope. We are working our way through the book of Acts and looking at how the disciples of Jesus kept going after Jesus ascended into heaven. Today we're in chapter 5 of Acts, and we get a glimpse of what was happening in the city of Jerusalem as Peter and John and the other apostles were doing some pretty amazing things. May I even say some crazy things in the name of Jesus. And the city was all talking about it. Imagine for me, just join me for a second, sitting down with a Jewish family during this time for dinner and talking about the news of the day. The dad comes home from work and he says, man, I have been hearing some crazy stuff that's going on down around the temple these days. Do you remember a few months ago, right around the Passover and the Romans, they crucified a guy named Jesus? And one of the kids says, yeah, I remember that. That was the day it got really dark. And then the mom says something to the effect of, yeah, that is the guy that the followers said rose from the dead. And he says, yeah, that's him. That's, well, those same guys that said he rose from the dead are healing people now and casting out demons. And the kid says, really, dad, do you believe it? Is it a scam? And he says, I don't know for sure. But one of my customers came in today He was down there, and he said it looked looked like the real deal. People were bringing sick people there, and and people that were demon-possessed, and he said one of his friends was even healed. Mom says, we should check it out. We need to go see this. Dad was like, I don't know. I bet the crowds are huge, and I hate crowds. Come on, Dad. It would be fun. I'm so tired. It's been such a long day. And mom says, let's go. What if this really is a thing of God and we were just too tired to go? I'm not sure if that conversation happened in any home, but something like that had to be going on in this town. Because listen to this story. Acts 5, 12 through 42. The apostles were performing many miracles, signs, and wonders among the people. And all the believers were meeting together at the temple in the area called Solomon's Colonnade. But no one else dared to join them, even though all the people had high regard for them. Yet more and more people believed and were brought to the Lord, crowds of both men and women. As a result of the apostles' work, sick people were brought out into the streets on beds and mats so that Peter's shadow might fall across some of them as he went by. Crowds came from the villages around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those possessed by evil spirits, and they were all healed." This is some amazing stuff going on. The crowds are coming out. Why are they crying out? Because God is doing some crazy stuff through some ex-fishermen. Peter's shadow? Really? Come on. Just let that shadow fall on people and they were being healed. God was using the miraculous to verify the messengers and the message that Jesus rose from the dead. How do you show up as something like this and miss God? When I was young, I was skeptical of the supernatural God stuff. It really was not part of my church experience, nor was it really part of my early life. There were some moments in my early life that I uh, experienced people dying in my life, and I was a pallbearer at several funerals before I graduated from high school. All of this affected how I saw God, so healing was not really part of how I experienced God. But then in college, I was introduced to a few students who became friends who were all about the signs and wonders. They were so excited about their faith. They loved Jesus and they experienced him in different ways than I did. They were early fans of a guy by the name of John Wimber, a pastor who believed that signs and wonders should be a part of our typical experience with God. It wasn't that I didn't believe or think or even come to the conclusion that God couldn't heal people. I actually thought he could. It just wasn't the way I expected God to show up. I wasn't looking for God in the same way they were. I also had a lie I had to shed that I subtly believed about God. There was an underlying struggle about how God really felt about me, how I perceived God. He either didn't want to or care to heal the people I prayed for, or I was not worthy, or I didn't have enough faith. So my belief about signs and wonders was not really about the power of God. 
It was more about how I experienced his motive toward me. Then in seminary, I met some fellow students and professors who were pretty sure that, they, that we lived in a time when God didn't do miraculous things at all. The opposite of the signs and wonder people I met that I had met in college. They believed that the spiritual gifts of the Bible, these guys, had ceased. Thus, they were called cessationists. I had a real struggle with how they got to this place theologically, especially since so many things happened that could only be explained by God's involvement and intervention and miracles. But they loved Jesus and believed in in miraculous Jesus, who was raised from the dead, but they believed that signs and wonders were just done. And I found myself somewhere in the middle, somewhere in between these places, and I needed to do some work on my understanding of God's motive toward me, and I needed to believe in the heart of God. And I need to trust that God was for me and loved me. I also was convinced that God was big enough to do whatever he wanted to bring glory to himself. If signs and wonders were needed to help people see God at work in this world, I believe without a shadow of a doubt, he would do exactly what he needed to do to show himself in this way. I also needed to be okay with people who believe God chose not to do that, to stop working through miracles and wonders because they love Jesus too. When I read this account of the signs and wonders of the apostles, I love seeing what can't be explained without God's involvement. They served to glorify God and to draw people to the place where they could hear the story of Jesus who died and rose from the dead. People just missed God because they were more interested in the sign itself than they were in God himself. Have you ever missed God because he didn't show up in the way you expected him to show up? Or you didn't like the way he showed up, or you didn't like the people he happened to be using at the time. Sometimes the ones who should have seen God right away miss him easily. So how did the religious leaders of the day miss God? We picked the story up back in Acts chapter 5 and verse 17. It says, The high priests and his officials, who were Sadducees, were filled with jealousy. They arrested the apostles and put them in public jail. But an angel of the Lord came at night, opened the gates of the jail, and brought them out. Then he told them, go to the temple and give the people this message of life. This echoes the prophecies of the Old Testament, the ringing uh, in people's ears of the idea of Isaiah speaks of the signs of the Messiah, the one that was healing, the one that was um, doing miraculous signs. And And the people were won over. God is making his presence known through an unlikely crew of men. The success of the apostles was causing some problems for the religious leaders of the day. It says they were filled with jealousy. Ever wonder why the religious leaders of the day miss Jesus? Ever wonder why they kept persecuting the disciples? The response of the leaders was sad but expected. They couldn't see God. Instead, they were filled with jealousy. When we are filled with jealousy, we can lose perspective. We will do what we have to when jealousy clouds our judgment to hold on to something. Definition of jealousy is the feeling, uh, feelings of resentment towards someone or their achievements or their possessions. It can be also defined as the unhappy feeling of being replaced in someone's affections. And that's what was happening. The religious leaders were being replaced You feel jealousy when you are afraid of losing something that you already possess. It's, it's loss is the fear here. They're losing something and they will do whatever they can to hold on to it. And they're in the midst of that. They just couldn't see God. And jealousy is characterized by feelings of fear and anger and resentment and insecurity. The leaders couldn't see the work of God right in front of them. They actually ended up opposing the work of God because they were losing the crowds to the disciples. Which in one respect is to miss the point altogether. First, you can't lose what you don't have. And secondly, they were not losing them to the disciples, they were losing them to Jesus. And can you really lose someone to Jesus? Well, the story continues. So at daybreak, the apostles entered the temple as they were told. So they get get out of jail by the angel and now they're going back to the temple and immediately began teaching. When the high priest and his officials arrived, they convened the high council, the full assembly of the elders of Israel. Then they sent for the apostles to be brought from the jail for trial. 
But when the temple guards went to the jail, the men were gone. So they returned to the council and reported the jail was securely locked with the guards standing outside. But when we opened the gates, no one was there. When the captain of the temple guard and the leading priests heard this, they were perplexed, wondering where it would all end. Then someone arrived with startling news. The men you put in jail are standing in the temple teaching the people. The captain went with his temple guards and arrested the apostles, but without violence, for they were afraid the people would stone them. Then they brought the apostles before the high council, where the high priest confronted them. We gave you strict orders never again to teach in this man's name, he said. Instead, you have filled all Jerusalem with your teaching about him, and you want to make us responsible for his death. But Peter and the apostles replied, We must obey God rather than any human authority. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead after you killed him by hanging him on a cross. Then God put him in the place of honor at his right hand as prince and savior. He did this so that the people of Israel would repent of their sins and be forgiven. We are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, who is given by God to those who obey Him. The once fearful disciples speak with boldness. They are not afraid. There's unshakable hope here is coming up against the fear of the religious leaders. The religious leaders are, are forced to face their own fears. And then it continues in verse 33. When they heard this, the high council was furious and decided to kill them. But one member, a Pharisee, a Pharisee named Gamil, was, who was an expert in religious law and respected by all the people, stood up and ordered that the men be sent outside the council chamber for a while. Then he said to his colleagues, men of Israel, take care what you are planning to do to these men. Some time ago, there was that fellow Thaddeus, who pretended to be someone great. About 400 others joined him, but he was killed and all the followers went their various ways. The whole movement came to nothing. After him, at the time of the census, there was Judas of Galilee. He got people to follow him, but he was killed too, and all his followers were scattered. So my advice is this, leave these men alone, let them go. If they are planning and doing these things merely on their own, it will soon be overthrown. But if it is from God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You may even find yourselves fighting against God. The others accepted his advice. They called in the apostles and had them flogged. Then they ordered them never again to speak in the name of Jesus, and they let them go. The apostles left the high council rejoicing that God had counted them worthy to suffer disgrace for the name of Jesus. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they continued to teach and preach this message. Jesus is the Messiah. This, this passage speaks to how hope comes up against fear. This is the clash between what is happening and how it is changing what is. It is hard to embrace something that is taking away your normal and your power. The leaders were afraid they were losing their power. And how emotions like jealousy can cloud our judgment. Emotions can prevent us from hearing from God or even seeing Him at work in our lives. Somehow, we need to acknowledge our emotion and to ask God for help to see what he is doing. Jealousy crowds out hope because we are allowing emotions to cause us to hold on to something in an unhealthy way. Turn it over to God. The leaders had a hard time seeing the possibilities of what God might be doing apart from them. This is the simple principle of rejoicing when God does this thing his thing, whether I am watching, spectating, or a participant, and rejoicing when God uses someone for something spectacular to bring about greatness in the kingdom. Well, what happens in the story? They listen to the advice of Gamil. The advice is, let them go. If what they are doing is of God, you won't be able to defeat them anyway. And if it is not of God, it will lose its power and fizzle. They listened but they beat them, flogged them, and warned them. So they tried to deter them from continuing. They used fear and intimidation against unshakable hope. And unshakable hope stands. It stands in opposition to fear. It stands in opposition to being intimidated. How in the world could Peter and John stop telling people that Jesus had risen from the dead? They had seen, them, seen him themselves. They had talked to him, and they got their purpose from him. 
Jesus was bigger than anything they faced, including the religious leaders of the day who could take their life. Put yourself in Peter and John's shoes for just a second. They're up against the people who had Jesus executed. What do they do? They remember and they recall and they experience the power of God. God was using them to heal people miraculously. People were following Jesus because of of what was going on around them. They were doing greater things than they could have imagined. They were getting arrested and rescued by angels. Jesus, their unshakable hope changed them. Then they go right back to what they were doing, right in plain view of the ones who arrested them and could kill them. If I was there, I'd join up with these guys. They really believed what they were saying. I'm sure that when people went to see what was happening, a few emotions came over them. This is exciting. When they went to see the show, when they went to see people healed, when they went to hear the teaching of the apostles, this is exciting. But there was skeptics there. Not everyone believed. There was fear there because it was so unbelievable. But yet there was belief. But when you encounter that kind of miraculous thing, you have to ask the question, what do I do now? I can't just go back to life as usual. I just saw the shadow of Peter heal someone. I just saw these guys arrested and beaten and they kept on. They actually counted it as a privilege to suffer like Jesus did. Something in the world has changed. They are saying God has visited us and he's still here showing his power through this group of fishermen. He has been raised from the dead and they are testifying with their very lives that it is true. I can't deny what I am seeing and that it's real. This would be unnerving. But our friends are healed. Who but God could do this? This story actually has three distinct perspectives with a mixed bag of responses, which is really what happens when God shows up. The disciples have this unshakable hope. They are in it for Jesus. The religious leaders are filled with jealousy. They are overcome with emotion and they stand against. And then there's the crowd with a mixed response. Some believed only God could do this and they followed. Some wanted to gain something, so they showed up to gain leverage or learn something or get power. Some wanted to see the show. This was amazing. Some were not convinced. Some were skeptical of the experience. Where do you find yourself in this story? I wonder if part of the response is, is what are we as people looking for when we encounter God? If God shows up in a way that we don't expect, what do we do with that? Do we conclude that it can't be God? What is the question for you today, for me today? And I think it's this, how are you expecting God to show up in your life? Can you rejoice with those who God uses greatly? Can you see God in circumstances that you don't expect? I've started looking for God in small ways. I hear God in a thank you and I see God in a smile. I hear God in the laugh of one of my grandkids. I see God in his provision as he takes care of people with very little means and some with great means. I can see the miracles around me if I am paying attention, big and small. I see God in as he perseveres for us, for journey, through this rough season. I see God when I am forgiven by people, by my children, by my wife. I see God when I'm drawn into a deeper relationship with Jesus, when I see his work in my life and the amazing little blessings that happen every day. Can God show up in ways we don't expect? Sure. And how do we know? And how do we see him? And I ask you this question, whatever it is that draws people into relationship with Jesus can be used for the kingdom of God. It's probably God doing his thing. Can you see him? Can you see him when he shows up? Or is he hard to see because you're expecting him in a different way? Jesus, help us. Help us to see you 
in the everyday life that we have, even in the big miracles when someone in our life gets healed or in the small things when we see the growth and the development of one of our kids or grandkids, when we see um, the, the relationships grow deeper through forgiveness and kindness, help us to see you at work so that we can join and marvel and strengthen our faith. Help us as we move into this next part, as we sing our praises and we sing our prayers and we look to you. Help us to hear from you. Help us to look for you. Help us to pay attention. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.